Hey, good morning, everyone. So today we're going to start the fourth section of this class, which now we're going to move into magnetism, which will be very similar to what we did with electricity. So the second portion, uh, and then after that we'll have an exam, and then we'll have the last portion of this class. But again, for the last portion, we won't get an exam on that until we get to the final. So basically, the way it's going to work is like last semester. So that means the last portion of the class will be half of the final exam. And then the other half will be cumulative type of stuff. So, right, so today we're going to start our exploration into magnetic fields. Uh, so just note that magnetic fields are denoted by a B vector. For those of you who haven't had lab yet, not an M vector. An M vector is actually what's called magnetization, something we're not going to see in this class. But and just notation uh, for engineering folks, especially for those of you who are going to take electrical engineering, you guys are going to call it H. Where in physics that stands for something completely different, which is another type of magnetic field, which is called the auxiliary field, it's related to the magnetic field, but that's not worried too much about that. And then uh, magnetic field has units of Tesla's, and we'll eventually define what a Tesla actually is. But the SI version is called a Tesla. You'll also see Gauss. Gauss is another unit that you can use for magnetic fields. It's related to a Tesla, but where is it out there? So basically, all we're going to do initially is kind of compare and kind of contrast electric fields versus magnetic fields and talk about kind of the similarities and the differences between them. And then from there, we'll start talking about what we did with electric fields and first look at forces generated by electric fields. And as we get comfortable with that, then we'll start looking at what actually generates magnetic fields and then how do we determine magnetic fields. And then we'll go back to forces once we have determined magnetic fields and then use those magnetic fields into magnetic forces. So basically all the same ideas that we did with electric fields. So first of all, electric fields, what's the source of an electric field? Hopefully we haven't forgotten about that yet. What's the source of an electric field? What creates an electric field? Okay, that's absolutely true. But where do we start off with? So you're right. I'll take that away from you. But we started with something more kind of general. It started with a CH. Charge, correct. So you're absolutely right. It is differences in potential, but we're going to write this as simply charge. So we know that this is charge, primarily static charges, but motion charges or charges which are in motion also create electric fields. Uh, that's right. So sources, we have potential, and we also have like differences in potential or changes in potential as well. That also creates electric fields. Go ahead. So it turns out that magnetic fields, though, these guys are actually sourced by charges as well, but actually moving charges. So it actually sources a magnetic field, as we talked about in the lab, is actually current, right? So this is actually sourced by moving charges. <clears throat> now, one major difference between electric fields and magnetic fields is charges. We always have what are known as electric monopoles, which basically means that I can have a positive charge or a negative charge that exists by themselves. Of course, I can have the two of them together that would create a dipole, but in nature, we always have what are known as electric monopoles. It means I can have an isolated positive charge, I can have an isolated negative charge. Each one of those are going to create an electric field. Magnetic fields, this is actually not true. So what happens in magnetic fields is, for example, if I look at a bar magnet, here's my bar magnet, north side, south side, this generates a magnetic field. But if I took this guy and I cut it, trying to isolate the north side and the south side, what actually happens? So if this is the north side, this is the south side, and I cut this magnet in half, can I isolate the north side? No, what happens? I get two magnets, right? What's going to happen then is this going to become north, this is going to become south, this is going to become north, this is going to become south. Which means that what? In this case, if I cut this one, I'm not going to create two of these guys. What happens in this case? Two magnets again, right? So again, I'm going to have a north side and a south side. I'm going to have a north side and a south side. No matter how many times I cut this thing, I can never, ever, ever, ever isolate a north pole by itself. I can never, ever, ever isolate a south pole by itself, which means that one difference between electricity and magnetism is that for magnet magnetism, there is no such thing as 
as a magnetic model. Which means we can never isolate a North Pole, we can never isolate a South Pole. Now, this will be very important when it comes to things like the Gauss's law. And we'll talk about this when we actually get there. But one of the implications of this <clears throat> is that we're always, always, always forced to have dipoles. So for magnetism, we always have dipoles. Always. Unlike electric fields, which again, we are sourced by simply a charge, but a charge is an electric monopole. So one of the major differences then is that in magnetism, there is no such thing as magnetic monopoles, but in electricity, there is such a thing as electric monopoles because we have positive charges, we have negative charges, we have electrons, we have protons. But in magnetism, we're never, ever, ever gonna have a single North Pole or a single South Pole. It's always gonna come as a dipole. So this will have huge implications when it comes to things like Gauss's law. So this has a huge impact on Gauss's law. Talk about this when we get back to Gauss's law. <clears throat> this has huge implications of Gauss's law. Now, one of the kind of funny things, though, about no existence of magnetic monopoles, at least we've never seen a magnetic monopole, is that a lot of our physics theories actually predict magnetic monopoles. So, for example, when you have the Big Bang and deflation, right? So, when you have the Big Bang, what happens is you go from one symmetry group to another symmetry group. What's known as spontaneous symmetry breaking. But a good example of this is when water turns from water to ice. What ends up happening is you get what's known as a relic. That relic is something that is inside of the new symmetry group, which in this case would be ice, which is a remnant of the original symmetry group. So if I had something, for example, when Big Bang happened, and I went from one symmetry group to another symmetry group, we have a relic which exists inside of our universe. That relic is what's known as a magnetic monopole. But we have never experimentally determined a magnetic monopole, at least we've never actually seen one. So in that case, we have to get rid of them. This is actually where the idea of inflation came from. So anybody know what inflation is? So basically, shortly after the Big Bang, our universe expanded from a size like this to about what we see today. So it's called inflation. It's a period of rapid expansion. So the idea of inflation actually wasn't to cure other things, but it was actually to hide magnetic monopoles. So the idea was that if we started off with a universe that was about this big, we had 100 magnetic monopoles, then we have to see one. But what's the best way to hide something? Ask my six-year-old son, he'll tell you. You push it under the rug. You hide it. So the idea of inflation was that we took our universe from this size, blew it up to almost infinite size. And in that case, if I have 100 magnetic monopoles inside of some space that's infinite in size, what's the likelihood that I'm going to find it? Basically zero. All right. So this is actually the original idea of inflation. This inflationary period that we went through shortly after the Big Bang was to simply do what your six-year-old son is going to do, which is hide the mess that he made. Entire point. But anyway. So again, the point is we have no magnetic monopoles, but our physics theories always tell us we should have magnetic monopoles, but we've never actually found one, so we've got to hide it somewhere. And this was the point of inflation. But anyways, I digress. So let's go back. What types of interactions do these guys have? Well, we know that electric fields have what types of interactions? Are they direct interactions or are they long-range interactions? They're long-range interactions, right? So these are long-range interactions. And we know further that we get what attractive forces between unlike charges. And we know that we get repulsive forces between the like charges. Magnetic fields also turn out to be long range forces. I know that's because. <laughs> Put here. I took this paper clip and I drop it on the table here, and then I took a magnet. Magnet. I can then attract the paper clip before I actually even touch the magnet. Right, so I can get a magnetic attraction between the two. 
proving that this is actually a long range interaction. Now, just like electric fields, though, it turns out we can have two different types of forces. We can have an attractive force and we can have a repulsive force. So for here, it turns out that we can have a traffic force or unlike poles. So meaning a north pole is attracted to a south pole and a south pole is attracted to a north pole. And we can also have a repulsive force between light poles. So again, a north pole is repelled away from a north pole. So in this case, these are two north poles. I try to push these together and they're not going to stay to each other. But again, if I have a north pole with a south pole, these guys are attracted to each other. Right? So again, I'm going to get a different type of interaction depending on how these guys are aligned with each other, just like that for electric fields. So how do we determine the field? Or remember, if we go all the way back to electricity, what we said is the way we determine the electric field is we have an electric field configuration. We drop a point charge into that electric field configuration, and then we look at the force on that point charge, and then we can determine the direction of the electric field from there. So from this, we're looking at the force on a test particle or test charge and direction of field is in direction of the force. So that's how we determine the direction of our electric field. So here, again, if this was my space that I was looking at, and I drop my test charge in here, this is my test charge Q. This thing then feels a force at this point. This is the direction of the force. And then we said the electric field then has to point in the direction of the force because this was a positive test charge. So this is the way we determine the direction of the electric field based off the direction of the force. For magnetism, it basically works exactly the same way, except here, we don't use something which is electric, we use something which is magnetic. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to take a bar magnet, something like this, suspend it, so basically put like a torsion wire on here, and then put that into an external magnetic field, and then this thing is going to rotate, it's going to feel a torque, and then rotate into the direction of the local magnetic field. It means that the direction at which the compass needle points is the direction of the magnetic field at that particular point. So we do exactly the same idea. So here, instead of using a positive charged particle, we're going to use a bar magnet, i.e. what we call a compass. And then the direction of the North Pole is in direction of the beacon. So what that means is, let's go back to our picture. So this was my region of magnetic field. In this case, all I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around with a compass. And the compass then is going to point in some particular direction. It's going to be the north pole direction. So then here I would say, well, my north pole then points in the direction of the local magnetic field in this case. So I know the local magnetic field is going to point in the direction of the north pole. This is also true when you use a compass around the Earth. So, for example, if here was the Earth, Earth, and then I walk around with my compass. So here's my compass. Then, in this case, my north is going to point in this direction, which means it's telling me that the local magnetic field, in this case, then is pointing in this direction. So this is the magnetic field, but not the Earth. But remember that a north pole is actually attracted to a south pole, which means that what it's pointing to is actually the magnetic south of the Earth, which happens to be the geogra geographical north. So no, these two things are different. So when I say north, this is the geographical, but it is actually the magnetic south. Okay, with us? <clears throat> then when it points in the south direction, that means this is the magnetic north side. Geometrical geographical south side. So those two things are actually opposite. So the North Pole is actually the geographical north, but the magnetic south pole, and the south pole is the geographical south south pole with the magnetic north pole. Okay. Finally, 
what do the electric field lines look like? Well, we know from electric fields, these things are straight lines. So these were straight lines. So again, just to remind you, look back to the page. So this was a positive charge. In this case, we said the electric field had to point radially away in straight lines in all different directions. This is my electric field. If I had a negative charge, in that case, they have to point radially inward all directions, but again, in straight lines. So for electric fields, these guys form straight lines. <clears throat> Magnetic fields, turns out, actually do not form straight lines. So these guys are actually circular lines, which form closed loops. So here, the magnetic field actually generates closed loops, where these closed loops are circular in nature. Right? So that means that if I go back to my bar magnet here, what we're going to find then is if I look at the magnetic field of my bar magnet, it's actually going to do this. This is then what my magnetic field is going to look like. For those of you who actually have already taken the lab, this is the last part of the lab where once you to draw the magnetic field of the bar magnets, this is what it should look like. So here, again, the direction of the magnetic field is going to be tangential to the actual line itself, meaning at this point, the magnetic field is pointing this way, this point, local magnetic field points this way, this point it points this way, this point is pointing this way. So anytime I have a closed loop, the direction of the magnetic field at a given point is tangent to the circle at this particular point. Okay. What's up there? So is it north? Like it has the circles on the left and the right, the poles themselves are the top and bottom. So how does that? Right, so here what always happens is magnetic field points away from the north and towards the south. So at this point, then the magnetic field will be pointing inward towards the south side. So this is what I would call the north direction of the magnetic field. But again, since it's attracted to the south side, it's going to point in towards the south side. But again, this would be the, the south side. And then from here, it's repelled away from the north side, which is why it's pointing away. So it always points away from negative or from north and towards south. That makes sense? So again, yeah, if I was holding my bar magnet here, the north side would be pointing in towards the south side, but pointing away then from the north side. But again, this is continuous, which means that it doesn't end at the end of the magnet. It actually continues all the way through the magnet itself and then out around. So it has to form completely closed circles. So it doesn't have a beginning and it does not have an end, unlike in the electric field where it does have a beginning, it does have an end. So caveat for this is there is no beginning, no end of the magnetic field. Okay. Cool. So now that we know that it creates circular lines, now we want to know is well, what does the electric field look like, or sorry, magnetic field look like around a current carrying wire. So let's look at the current carrying wire. And let's look at the magnetic field around that current carrying wire. So for example, let's say here's my wire and I have current and then moving in this direction. So this is the direction of the current. So the question then is, well, what does the magnetic field look like? So to answer that, let's watch the video. So basically what I have here is a wire down a little bit so it gets a little bit better. So there's a wire running here. So this is the wire. And then here are four magnets set up around this guy. So this is our compasses. So each one of these has north pointing in the same direction, meaning that it's pointing in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at this point. Okay. So then what he's going to do is after some time, we'll turn on the current to run then through the wire. And we want to see what happens then to the currents, or at least to the bar magnets. So notice now when he turns them on, all of the compass needles now have shifted and they all now point into different directions, right? 
So what happens now then is this one, which was originally pointing this way, now it's pointing in this direction, it's pointing to the west. This one then was originally north this way, but then had rotated this way, so now it's pointing in this direction. This one was also north, but it rotated this way, so now it's pointing to the east. This one is just a little bit rotated, so it's almost still kind of pointing in the north direction, but not so much. So what ends up happening then is as this thing is showing is that the magnetic field actually creates a closed circular loop around this current carrying wire in the form of a circle. This was what we were also supposed to get out of the lab Monday or Tuesday, whenever you guys have left. So this tells us then the direction at which this thing is actually rotating. But how do I know if it's going to go in this direction, which would then be the counterclockwise direction, or how do I know if it's going to go in this direction, which would then be the clockwise direction? So to answer that question, we have to start writing down some right-hand rules. So we're going to write down what's known as right-hand rule number one. So first off, we know that the direction of the magnetic field B is a closed circle. Around the wire, but to establish the actual direction, we're going to write down what's known as right-hand rule number one. So, first very important thing with right-hand rule number one means which hand are we going to use? Our right hand or our left hand? Right hand. Good. It's in the name. So good. Make sure when it comes to the exam, we're using our right hand and not our left hand. It's an important distinction because if I use my left hand, I get a completely the opposite answer if I'm using my right hand. Okay, so I'll get the wrong results. This stuff, magnetism, highly, highly relies on your right hand. We're ultimately going to have about four different right hand rules. Two of them are the same, so we're going to call it only three, but technically we're going to have three different right hand rules, which means for those of you who are right handed in this class, who's right handed? Basically, everybody. That means when you're doing the exam, you have to put down your pencil, use your right hand, pick up your pencil, and then write the results. If you're left handed, you don't have to do that because you can see you going and you keep writing life straight. But, so that means on this exam, I get to watch you guys do this. It's going to be great. I get to laugh at you. Life is fun. So, how does this work? So, right hand rule number one says if I want to know the direction of the magnetic field around this current carrying wire, what I have to do is number one, point thumb, which is perpendicular to your hand, in direction of the current up. So in this case, current is running upward in this case. So I would put my thumb 90 degrees to my hand in the direction of the current. So that's the direction of my thumb. Step number two, fingers curl around in direction of the magnetic field. So what that means is, again, my current is running upward in this case, so I put my thumb in the direction of the current. My fingers would then curl around in the direction of the magnetic field, which means in this case, my magnetic field would do that. This is my magnetic field. So it starts off back here behind the wire, curls around in this case in this direction, which means I could call this, for example, the counterclockwise direction. Okay with this? So this is the direction of a magnetic field around a current carrying wire. Again, it's going to form a closed circle, which means that this has a constant radius of r. We'll talk about how this depends on the distance of r later. So there's going to be a constant radius of r, and it's going to curl around the wire where the direction is dictated by the right hand. So again, thumb in the direction of the current, fingers curl around in the direction of the magnetic. Let's do a couple of examples. Let's just make sure that we got this guy. So let me draw. Let's say here's my wire. Here's another wire. Let's do it this way. Uh, draw another wire going here. And let's draw another wire here. Okay. 
So for this one, let's say we got current going down in this direction. For this one, let's say current going in this direction. Let's say for this one, I got current coming out. So anytime I draw a dot, this refers to as out. So think about this as an arrowhead coming towards your face. That's the tip of the arrow. That's the rest of the arrow. So that's coming at you. And if it's going in, I'm going to draw it this way, where this refers to in. So that means that current is going in this direction. So this would be the quiver. So you're looking at the feathers on the back of the arrow as it's moving away from you, where this one is the arrowhead dots moving towards you. So for each one of these, what's the direction of the magnetic field? This is what we want. So let's look at this one first. Is it moving in the clockwise direction or counterclockwise direction? Clockwise, good. So in this case, I put my thumb in the direction of the current. My fingers would curl around in the direction of the magnetic field, which means for this guy, it would be curling around in the clockwise direction. So this would be my magnetic field. So this would be clockwise. It's happening at a fixed radius of R. What about the arrowhead? Counterclockwise. Now, yeah, okay. So in this case, I put my thumb in the direction of the current, curl my fingers around in the direction of the magnetic field. So in this case, my fingers can curl around in this direction. Uh -huh. And add a fixed radius of R. What about this one? What's going to be in the new direction of the magnetic field? So this side is going to be up around. Good. So it's going to go like that. Exactly. Good. So as Tim said, it's going to start down here, come around, and then come do something like that. So it's the direction of the magnetic field, which means at this point, it's coming out. At this point, it is going in. So here, if I drew a dot, my magnetic field would then be pointing in this direction. And here, it would be going into the board. Good. And then what about this one? So like that, like this. It would curl around in this direction. That means on this side it would be coming out. This side it would be coming in. But here I'm going to get this. E. So we get here it's going to be coming out. And here it's going to be coming in. Good. So this is right hand rule number one. So right hand rule number one tells me the direction of the magnetic field. Around a current carrying. So now that we know it has a magnetic field, we know the direction of the magnetic field. The next thing we want to know then is if I put that wire into an external magnetic field, what happens to it? Well, what we know now is what? the magnetic field or the wire has a magnetic field. If I put that into an external magnetic field, what's going to happen? What's that? Induce a current? Is that what you said? Not yet. Not yet. We're getting there. Not yet. Well, we now know if we have two magnetic fields, what happens between two magnetic fields? They have to feel force. Right. So what's going to happen is this is going to result itself onto a force on the wire. So what happened then is I'm going to create a force on the wire by putting a current carrying wire into an external magnetic field. So let's say here is my external magnetic field, or not external magnetic field. This is my current carrying wire. I don't actually have a wire, but it's close enough. So again, what I have here is what we talked about this before. So again, I'm creating a huge potential difference between this side and this side, causing charged particles to accelerate from one side to the other side, which means I have a current. My current current. I have a bar magnet. This is then a external magnetic field. If I put this guy in the presence of an external magnetic field, I can then cause this guy to deflect and move around, which means I can create a force on it. Okay with us? So what I know then is this thing is going to feel a force. So what I want to know is what is this force on the wire? So what is the force on the wire? So to answer this, let's do a few experiments. So experiment number one we're going to do is I'm going to put the current parallel to the direction of the external magnetic field. 
and find out what happens. Okay? Which basically means that in this case, my current is running, say, in this direction. So I want the magnetic field to also go in this direction. That's going to be experiment number one. Experiment number two, then, we want the current then perpendicular to the external magnetic field and see what happens in this case. Experiment number three, we're then going to change the direction of either the current or the magnetic field, which means in this case, I want the current to then go in the opposite direction, still perpendicular to the external magnetic field, or simultaneously switch the direction of the magnetic field and see what happens. Experiment number four, we want to change the size of the magnetic field and see what happens. Meaning I'm going to use either a smaller external magnetic field or a bigger external magnetic field and see what happens. Number five, I'm then going to change the size of the current and also see what happens. So I want to see does the magnetic field or the force get bigger or smaller. And then finally, I want to change the amount inside of the magnetic field, which means I'm going to change the length. So I'm going to change how much of the wire is actually inside of the external magnetic field and then see what happens. In this. So let's throw out each one of these different results. So in the first case, it turns out that if we put the current carrying wire parallel to the direction of the magnetic field. So here's my current carrying wires. So my current is going this way. And I'm going to put my magnetic field either in the same direction or anti-parallel. So if I do it in this case, in this direction, what we find in this case then for result number one is that the magnetic force on the wire turns out to be zero. I get no magnetic force. Number two. For number two, we're now going to put the external magnetic field, say, going in this direction. In this case, what we find is that the magnetic force is not equal to zero. And in fact, the magnitude of the force is equal to a maximum. So I find the maximum amount of magnetic force on this wire. Number three, if I then change the direction of the current, or if I change the direction of the external magnetic field, what happens in this case then is that the force switches direction. The direction of the force changes. So if I change the direction of the current or if I change the direction of the magnetic field, the direction of that force then switches. So it goes in the opposite direction of what it was before. So in this case, it rotates by 180 degrees. Okay. Number four, if we use a smaller magnetic field, we find is that as the magnetic field strength size decreases, the magnitude of the force also decreases. So if I use a smaller magnetic field, the amount of force felt on that wire decreases. Number five, if I use a smaller current, also the size of the force decreases. So if I don't run as much current through this current current wire, the size of the force then decreases. And then finally, number six is if I use a smaller length, so let's say this is the length of my wire here, but if I put less of it inside of the magnetic field, which means if I decrease the size of the length, what happens in this case is also the size of the magnetic force decreases. Let's go through each one of these different results and see what it actually tells us. So these two together tells us something about the angle. What does that tell us about the angle? So in the first case, if the magnetic field is parallel to the direction of the current or anti-parallel to the direction of the current, and I get zero force, but if I put them perpendicular to each other, I get maximum amount of force. What does that tell me then about the dependence on the angle between those two things? Sign. Sign, right? So this tells me these two guys together tell me that these have to go as sine of the angle, right? 
because again, sine of zero or sine of 180 degrees is simply equal to zero, sine of 90 or sine of 270 is equal to one, which is the maximum value it can be. So when these guys are perpendicular, sine of 90 or sine of 270 is one. When I have sine of zero or sine of 180, that gives me zero. So this tells me it has to go as a sine term. We'll skip three for now, we'll come back to three. What is the fourth one that tells me? The fourth one tells me if the magnetic field goes down, then the magnitude of the magnetic field go, or magnetic force goes down. So what does that tell me about how the magnetic field is related to the magnetic force? What's that? They're directly proportional to each other. So this one tells me that the magnitude of the magnetic force then is directly proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field. What about the fifth one? Current goes down, the force goes down. How are these guys related? Directly proportional again. So this tells me that the magnitude of the force is also directly proportional to the current. And then finally, the last one the length goes down, the magnetic field goes down. How are these guys related to each other? Also directly proportional, right? So this tells me that the magnetic force then is directly proportional also to the length of the wire. Now, if I put all these results together, what this tells me then is that the magnetic force on the wire magnitude is then equal to the current times the length times the magnetic field times sine of the angle between the two. <clears throat> now, since this thing goes as a sine, this guy's a vector, this guy is also a vector. Is this thing going to be a cross product or is it going to be a down product? Be a cross graph. So if I wrote this thing in terms of a vector, this then is going to be equal to the current times the length written as a vector crossed by the external magnetic field. So this is actually the force on a current carrying spring player. Are you okay with this? Now the fact that this is a cross product. Also answers the question of number three that if I change the direction of the current or if I change the direction of the force, this thing flips by 180 degrees. I remember that cross products will flip by 180 degrees if I change one of these guys. If I make this negative, it changes that, this becomes negative. Make this one negative also then becomes negative. So now there are some caveats of this. Caveat number one is that what? this is only true. Or straight wires. And only true for constant magnetic fields. Meaning that anything other than those two things, this doesn't work anymore. So if I don't have a straight wire, meaning if it was bent, or if I have a external magnetic field which was not uniform. This would also be different. So how would we have to do it in this case? Well, the way we do it in this case is let's say here's my current carrying wire. So let me make this thing bent just for some piece. Let's say here's my current going through this direction. I'll talk about all these different things in just a second. Uh, and let's say my magnetic field, I don't know, does something weird kind of like this. So my magnetic field. So what would we have to do in this case? What we'd have to do in this case then is we'd have to cut the wire up into small sections where each one of these sections is approximately equal to a straight line. Right? So in this case, what I'd have to do is chop this thing up into a small section. Here's my small section. Let's call that then delta L, right? where in this case, the direction of delta L points in the direction of the current at this point. So this is the direction of the current, which means delta L in this case is a vector which then points in the direction of the current, which is going to be the same thing back here. So when I write out this vector L, because remember I is a scalar quantity, so we promote L to a vector where the direction of this vector points in the direction of the current. We'll write all that down in just a second. But in this case, my delta L is going to point here. So in this case, I'm cutting up delta L so that this is approximately a straight line here. My magnetic field at this point then is approximately equal to a constant. So at this point, I'm just going to look at the direction of the local magnetic field here and then in this case i would then say well the differential amount of force inside of this wire here at least on this wire then is going to be equal to the current times then the differential length 
delta F, crossed then by the external magnetic field. Then to find the total amount of force, all I would do then was sum over all of these delta Fs. And then finally, I would take the limit that delta L goes to zero. So this says then is that the total force on my wire then is going to be equal to the sum over all of these different delta F I's, which is then equal to the sum over I, and then the current times then delta L I crossed by then B I. Finally, we're going to take the limit that delta L I goes to zero of this thing, which means that this thing is going to turn into a one. Take the limit of a sum. And it's cool. So finally, this is going to become equal to the integral of the current integrated over the differential length crossed then by the external magnetic. So this is technically our force on a current carrier wire. <clears throat> now again, what's the difference? The difference here is that I'd have to use this in one of two cases or both. Either it's not a straight wire or the magnetic field is not constant, or both. If my wire is straight, and if the magnetic field is constant, then I would use simply this guy. Okay, this one is only true if both straight and constant magnetic field. If not, I then have to use the other case. So what does all this thing mean? So what this means is what again, let's say here's my current carrying straight wire. So I got current running in this direction. So how does this thing work? So let's say my magnetic field points in this direction. This is B, this thing has a length to it, L. Or I'm going to pronote that length to an L vector, which then points in the direction of the current. So this is my direction of L, where the magnitude of L vector is simply equal to the length of the wire. Okay with us? So the way I would then determine the direction of the force is I would then use what's known as a right hand rule number two. So let's write down right hand rule number two. So for right hand rule number two, let's say I have arbitrarily three vectors. I'm going to have vector A, I'm going to have vector B, and then I'm going to have vector C. Where what I want to look at is vector A crossed by vector B is then equal to vector C. So how does right hand rule number two work then? Well, the way right hand rule number two works is step one, point fingers in direction of the first vector. Which in this case would be our vector A, okay? So we would point our fingers in the direction of the first vector, which is vector A. So let me over here, draw a vector A. So this is a vector A. So what we do is we would simply put our fingers in the direction of vector A. Great. Step number two. Curl fingers in direction of smallest angle. Toward the second vector which in this case would be vector B. Ready to read that? Didn't leave myself much room. What's up? Where's vector A coming from? Well, vector A would be given. So in this case, it would be, so if I go back to this okay. guy, it would be the direction of the current. We're not using it for your book. No, in this case, we're not. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to draw some other random vector. Okay. Let's call that vector B. So what this says is, first, I put my fingers in the direction of the first vector, vector A. Curl them in the direction of the smallest angle towards vector B, which means the vector B is here. i got to rotate my palm. So my palm then points towards the direction of B, and then curl my fingers to the direction of B. Step number three. Thumb, which is at a 90 degree angle from our hand, is then going to point in the direction of the resultant vector, which is vector C. Okay. And step number three. Thumb. Perpendicular to hand points 
record the results, in this case, vectors. So this is the way right hand rule number two works. So yeah. The process is three steps. Number one, point your fingers in the direction of the first vector, vector A. Curl towards the second vector in the direction of the smallest angle, which means this is the smallest angle, not this angle. So I'd have to rotate my palm towards vector B. Curl towards vector B. My thumb then points in the direction of vector C, which means vector C in this case is coming out of the board. Okay. This is the right hand rule number two. So let's do some examples of this and let's see how this works. So let me say vector A goes this way, vector C goes this way. I want to know what C is. Uh, let's say vector A goes this way, vector B goes into the board. So this is vector C. Um, let's say vector A goes this way, vector B comes out of the board. And then finally, let's say vector A goes this way, and then vector B goes this way. So what I want to know in these four different cases, what's the direction of vector C? What about the first one? What's the direction of C? What's that? Good. So we're going into the board. So in this case, we're going to have an X vector C. Right? So again, point your fingers in the direction of A. A points this way. B is downwards. I got to rotate my palm to go downwards. Curl towards B. My thumb then points into the board. So in this case, vector B goes into the board. What about this one? Yes, one. Yes, one. To the right. Good. So A is down this way. B is in this direction. So that's right. So C goes to the right. Okay, C is going to be this way. What about the third one? Oh, good. C is this way. In this case, A is this way, B is inwards, so my thumb points in the direction of C. And what's the last one? There is no answer. Good. C is equal to zero. Why is that? They're anti parallel from each other. So in this case, the angle is 180 degrees. Angle is 180 degrees, which means the cross product is equal to zero. Okay. Now, let's talk about some quick properties. So, properties of cross products. We talked about these before, but let's talk about them again. Uh, property number one is that vector C will always be perpendicular to both A and B. This is always going to be true. So what has to be true is that vector C, the resultant vector, will be perpendicular simultaneously to both of the original two vectors. This is always going to be true. Which means that <clears throat> what A and B together create a plane, and C is perpendicular to that. Uh, property number two is remember that the magnitude of A cross B tells me how perpendicular two vectors are to each other. Uh, I guess I'll leave it there. There's a whole bunch of other properties, but I don't think they'll be that. So, so this is right-hand rule number two. What's up? What is number two? Oh, so it says the magnitude of A and B tells me how perpendicular A and B are to each other. So remember, cross product tells me how perpendicular these two guys are to each other. Okay. So the way that this works then is, since this thing is, let's go back to... Uh, Back to the original definition, this guy. What this says then is I can determine the direction of the force based off the right hand rule by number one, putting my fingers in the direction of L, but the direction of L is in the direction of the current, so I'm going to put my fingers in the direction of the current. Curl then towards the direction of the magnetic field, and then establish what's the direction of the force. Okay. 
Okay. So if I go back to one of my pretty pictures here. So in this case, I put my fingers in the direction of the current, curl towards the direction of the magnetic field, which would be upward. So in this case, I'd have to rotate my palm, curl towards the magnetic field. My thumb would then be pointing in the direction of the magnetic force, which means in this case, my magnetic force would be into the for the gray. Or the blue one and the green one, of course, is just equal to zero because there's no they're parallel and anti-parallel, so there is no direction. <clears throat> so what's going to happen then is that the direction of the force will always be perpendicular to the direction of the currents, which means it's either going to be deflected this way, this way, up or down, or some other direction, but not in the direction in which the current is moving. What's up? Did you go back to the force for the not straight line? That one? No, the one that's not. Oh, not straight. So tomorrow we'll do a couple examples of these, see how these actually work, and then we'll start talking about forces on charged particles. Okay. Can you move it where um, we were looking for C? I have, I have a question. Sure. How do you find C? So this one, okay, A is on this way. B is in the board. So I go A, D, and then my thumb points in the direction. Okay, so this A, and then D, and this inside. Then how do you rotate your hands? Well, you want your, you want to rotate your fingers in the direction of the whole thing. Oh, okay. So in that case, I have to point my palm in the direction of the whole thing. Okay. So it's going to be true every time. Okay. okay? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to write it real quick. Huh? All set? Yeah, yeah. Okay.